and his error didn't just cost him his own life. Few errors of that type do. She forced herself to focus on the matter at hand rather than go down that road of dark memories. Sergeant Jace, Sergeant Tamaga, this is Commander Poe. Please report to the fighter deck with ten Marines, five from the Phoenix and five from the 51st Brigade. Come heavily armed, please. Poe out. Ayala murmured. Do you think it will come to that? I sure hope not. But if it does, we'll be ready. Suarez's wound wasn't bad, but the man would definitely need surgery to repair his rotator cuff, according to the medic at Villar's compound. Jake wondered what sort of business Villar ran that would require the presence of an on-call medic. In fact, the place seemed to be teeming with people. Men and women, young and old, even several older children could be seen at times. Destiny must be like a true frontier town in old times, where it was a family business and everyone helped, even the young. The old medic sniffed and scratched underneath the electronic-looking ring around his neck as he peered into the gaping wound on Suarez's shoulder. It had finally stopped bleeding, and whatever the medic had given him for pain seemed to have worked, since the marine no longer winced whenever he moved. I can't guarantee a clean scar. I'm a little short-staffed and... Surgery isn't really my specialty, but I can patch that cuff up nice and good. You'll be ready for work within a few weeks. Jake shook his head. Uh, doctor, we're not planning on sticking around long enough for it to matter. He thought it was a little odd the man was offering to perform surgery on Suarez's shoulder. I'd rather leave it up to our doctor on the Phoenix. He's an accomplished surgeon. But thank you, anyway, for the offer. The man peered up at him somewhat wryly. Suit yourself. He stood up and packed his medic bag. I'll be around. Just let me know when you want your surgery, he said to Suarez. Keep it bandaged in the meantime and put that antibacterial cream on it again in a few hours. He strode out the door, and Villar came in to take his place, accompanied by several aides. Gruff men who looked like guys that Jake wouldn't want to meet in a bar fight. At least not sober. Mercer, I think the men who followed us are gone. We need to figure out how to get you to your ship. I finally located Velasky, and he's keeping your shuttle safe. Will you authorize him to pilot it over here? Jake eyed her warily. Uh, sure. How soon can he get it here? It will be several hours. We'd prefer not to fly it until morning. The local authorities are a bit jumpy about off-world vessels flying around the city at night. Will you relay your command authority to him? Jake paused, debating whether it was safe. Well, there was no other choice that he could see. Can't you just fly us out to the shuttle? Surely the authorities wouldn't mind a local flying around at night. Uh, you'd be surprised, Captain. Destiny is not Earth. You have to earn trust here, or take it by force. Fortunately, I've earned a bit for myself, but it doesn't transfer to you just because you know me. She reached down to her side and lifted a canteen up to her lips that hung at her side. Drinking deeply, she glanced at them and said, oh, Thirsty? Jake nodded and looked down at Suarez, whose mouth was bone-dry between the chase and the shock of all the blood loss. Villar nodded to the two men beside her, one of whom opened a cabinet drawer, extracted a few canteens, and filled them at the sink in the corner of the room. The men distributed them to the visitors. "'Thank you,' said Jake, and held one up to Suarez's lips. Alessandro gulped the water down, and Avery sniffed at his before likewise drinking." A bit dribbled down his chin and wet the dusty clothes given him by Villar. Only Ben set his aside before turning back to Villar. You gotta be kidding yourself to think we'd give Velasky the command authorization for the shuttle. Villar held up her hands. Suit yourselves. I can transport you all back to the shuttle in the morning by ground car. Well, there's no telling who may try to stop us. I've called a few contacts since we arrived here, and word on the street is that you'd fetch a high price. Some admiral's out to get you people and is willing to pay dearly for it. He's even willing to work with the syndicates. Ben sneered. Like you? Villar shrugged. I suppose if you want to think of me like that. I assure you, Captain, she turned back to Jake from glaring at Ben, that my business is entirely legitimate. And what business is that? Jake asked. He shook his head. Being shot at and the general lack of sleep from the past week was starting to take its toll. Uranium. Destiny has rich uranium deposits and I run one of the larger mining operations. In fact, this compound sits over one of the smaller mines. The larger ones are on the eastern edge of the continent, 
where the two continental plates are pulling apart, exposing virgin deposits. Jake glanced down at Suarez. The man had fallen asleep, finally. He struggled to keep his own eyelids open. Struggled a little too hard, in fact. Then he glanced at the canteen still in his hands. What the fuck did... He lurched. Black clouds seemed to swirl at the edges of his vision. He was vaguely aware of Ben catching him before he fell into the table of equipment that the medic had left behind. He turned to Villar and with a thick tongue said, You'll regret... But before he could finish the sentence, his eyes closed. The smirking grin of Villar's face, the last image engraved on his mind. Ben glared at Villar, who still smirked. Gently he lay his friend down on the floor and stood up, watching Villar's two assistants warily. Behind him he heard two dull thuds. Avery and Alessandro had fallen into the rear wall. He glanced back at the guards. They had extracted a sidearm, high caliber by the looks of them, and both were now pointed at his head. He's right, you know, said Ben, trying to formulate some kind of strategy, and yet knowing there was little hope of not only overcoming the two armed guards, but the rest of the guards of the compound, who were probably similarly armed. You regret this. The resistance doesn't look too kindly on people who... Valar guffawed. The resistance is dead, Commander. It's all over the news broadcasts. Just yesterday I watched as Imperial Police Squadrons raided the offices of former resistance members, hauling them off in handcuffs. Truth and reconciliation is over. The resistance blew it. Everyone in the Thousand Worlds saw a little stunt that you tried to pull in orbit over Earth last week and I'm afraid you'll find that public sentiment has turned against you. Ben eyed the nearest gun, pointed at his head, and judged the distance between them. we still got the Phoenix in orbit. They'll send a force down, and when they get here, you'll wish, what, wish that I just killed you? No, Commander. You see, the people who try to rescue you will eventually find themselves joining you in my mines. Just think of it. How many men and women on your ship? You might be able to double my workforce and it's far better than what Trajan was going to do to you. In time, you'll come to see me as your savior rather than your captor. Without me, you'd be dead already. Ben snorted. He took the barest step towards the nearest guard while motioning his arms in an expiration of disgust. Please, you honestly think I'll ever be thankful to you? You're deluded, that's what you are. He turned to one of the men, the one to Villar's right. With another furtive step, he came ever closer to the one on the left. So... What, is she paying you? Or are you slaves, too? Ben noticed the electronic neckband on the man, and finally understood. Slaves, indeed. Spying a thin, translucent wire that ran from the collar to the skin, he finally realized what the devices were. How can you live like this? He said to the guard, trying to fill his voice with pity. You're a slave? To her? Why don't you just kill yourself and be done with it? Not let her cut your balls off and have you at her beck and call. What, does she make you polish her boots, too? The man took a step forward, and the hand holding the gun quivered. In the tense moment, Ben managed another stealthy shuffle in the direction of the other guard, who was now just feet away. Just another step. Stay where you are, barked Villar. Her voice had decidedly changed since the pretense of friendship had fallen. Both of you. Commander, if you take another step, I assure you it will be your last. She pulled her own gun out of her overcoat and pointed it at his head. With her other hand, she extracted what looked like a comm device, which she fingered on and held up toward him. The command, authorization, please, Commander. You're a deluded bitch if you think I'll give that up willingly. He sneered at her. They fought their way through literally dozens of Imperial ships, managed to convince a hostile Marine Brigade to lay down their arms, and had narrowly averted the catastrophic damage from the fire they'd taken during the battle over Earth. And now here they were about to be taken hostage by a slaver. It irked him, to say the least. Villar responded by pointing the gun down at Jake's prone head on the floor. The command, authorization, commander. Quickly, please, or your captain dies, and then you. Ben swore but took a deep breath, praying that Poe would have the sense to see through whatever Villar and Velasky were planning. Fine. Command authorization, Jemez, Delta 159, Echo Z. Transfer command of Phoenix shuttle to arbitrary control. 
Satisfied, Villar thumbed the comm off and returned it to her pocket. She nodded once to the man at her right, the one Ben had insulted. He withdrew another gun from his jacket, this one a bit larger, and Ben recognized it as something a little less deadly than the other firearm in the man's hand. This one fired darts, and within seconds, Ben writhed in pain as the dart released its charge of tranquilizer deep into the flesh of his thigh. He fell to his knees. The same guard stepped forward and, looking at Valar, said, "'May I?' She shrugged her indifference and turned to leave. The guard swung hard with his gun, and Ben, with the last bit of consciousness he had, felt the blow hit his left temple, and he knew no more. Velasky entered the commands into the shuttle navigation computer to approach the Phoenix fighter bay and make a slow, deliberate landing. He knew what he had to do. He had been rehearsing the plan in his mind for days now, and yet he still couldn't help but think of other ways, other things he might say or paths he might take to accomplish the mission. But his path was set. It was too late to change his mind. The opening doors to the fighter bay loomed large through the front viewport, and Velasky turned to look at his navigator. You ready, Mort? The other man jabbed his fingers at a few buttons on the control panel. Clearly the man was not ready. He'd been against the plan since Velasky had presented his men with it days earlier. Too risky. They were sticking their necks out too far. You sure about this, Vlad? What with all these... Ex-Imperials have been through, I don't think they're going to take our shit. Velasky nodded. He agreed. Captain Mercer had seemed easygoing enough, trusting even, but his two companions, Commanders Jemez and Poe, had seemed far more leery when he met them. The distrust showed in their eyes and sounded in their voice. He'd have to use that. No, I'm not sure. He turned back to his own controls. But what choice do we have? He absentmindedly reached under the heavy folds of his thick shirt and fingered the electronic collar around his neck underneath. His collar. He hated the term. Dogs wore collars, not men. How many years had he worn it now? Ten? Twelve? After the fifth year, they all seemed to blur into one long nightmare. Mott eased up on the controls, which slowed their approach to the fighter bay which loomed ahead. We always have a choice, Vlad. Velasky shook his head. The alternative to obeying is death, for us and our families. Don't think I haven't thought this through. I know the stakes. The giant bay doors passed out of view, and the vast fighter deck lay out before them, looking even more put together than the last time he had seen it the day before. The repair crews must have finally made it to the fighter bay. Oh, and I believe you've thought it through. I'm just not so sure about your choice. Velasky grimaced. Neither was he. So, are you saying you don't believe Wellar when she says that if we can bag this ship it'll earn our freedom? Mott said his chin. No. Yeah. Me neither. He glanced back into the passenger compartment and nodded at the men huddled there. Velasky's most trusted fighters and officers each of them outfitted with body armor, assault rifles, and a grim determination to carry out the brutal task ahead. It would not be easy, but it would be worth it. Freedom always was. Poe watched as the shuttle sat down gracefully on the fighter deck. Velasky was at least a good pilot, if nothing else. She peered up at the walkway ringing the bay, halfway up the giant walls, and nodded to Sergeant Tamaga, and then again at Sergeant Jace who had both donned battle-scarred ASA suits and trained their assault rifles on the entrance hatch of the shuttle. Poe realized this would be a very inopportune time for Tamaga to show his true colors, if he was indeed playing her. Just like that, it would all be over. The phoenix lost. But her gut told her otherwise. Tamaga may guard his emotions and mind well, but he couldn't hide the look in his eye. He was absolutely loyal, not to the Empire, but to his men. She could see it in his interactions with them, and knew that his first priority was to get them to safety. The door opened, revealing Velasky standing at the hatch opening. He started walking down the ramp slowly before it had stopped moving. When he reached the bottom, he turned back to the cockpit and signaled for his co-pilot to shut the door. 
Well, at least he didn't come out with guns blazing. Poe nodded her approval to herself and took a few steps to the men, who greeted her handshake with a grim smile. Commander Poe, he said. Captain, is this private enough for you? She watched him look up at the marines flanking the ship at every angle. A little crowded in here. Mind if we talk somewhere else? She regarded him. If he was planning on storming her fighter bay or ambush her during their meeting, he sure wasn't placing himself in a very strategic position. Conference room good enough? That will be fine. She waved her arm back to the bullet-riddled doors to the fighter bay's anteroom. Follow me, she said, before turning to Ensign Ayala, who had accompanied her. It felt good to at least have someone at her side, even if she was only an ensign with less than two years of experience in the fleet. As they passed through the fighter bay, she suddenly realized that not all of the senior staff was on the planet below. Ensign, get Lieutenant Grace. I'd like her to join us. Yes, sir, said Ayala, and the white-haired woman spoke softly into her comlink as Poe turned back to Velasky, who followed behind as they made their way through the anteroom to the conference room. I trust your men on the shuttle will be quite comfortable while they wait? she asked. Poe watched as he gave a start a nervous shadow passing over his face. She went on. Surely you realize we would scan the shuttle before you landed? Or did you think you could hide the presence of sixteen well-armed men accompanying you? I assure you, Commander, they are there for all of our protection. Yours included. I'm sure, she said, flashing a tight smile. Just be advised that if the door to that shuttle opens again before you get back on it, an entire battalion of marines will make your men regret it. Velasky hesitated. Understood, Commander. Strange. He seemed so demure, hesitant, uneasy. Quite unlike the man she had met before. Earlier he was far more brash, commanding. On the view screen, when they had first seen him, he was a man in control. A captain, not just in command of his ship, but a rather respectable fleet. The doors to the conference room slid open and Anya Grace ambled in. What's up, Poe? As usual, her uniform top was tied around her waist by the sleeves, revealing her tattooed arms and shoulders. I'm knee-deep in training newbies how not to crash into the hull, so this better be important. Poe waved her to a seat. Actually, I thought it would be a welcome break. Grace flipped the chair around and straddled it. Yeah, you're right. I'm telling you, Poe, these newbies are really making me nervous. And I don't get nervous, remember? Just an hour ago, one of them nearly punched a hole in the wall out there because he accidentally hit the gravitic accelerator during landing. Little fucktard. She trailed off when she saw Poe indicate Velasky, who had taken a seat next to Ensign Ayala. Lieutenant Grace, this is Captain Velasky of the ship. She broke off, realizing she didn't even know the name of his ship, much less any of his affiliations. The Gamble. That's my ship. And the fleet out there... Well, that actually mostly belongs to Wellar, though she lets me command the day-to-day -day operations. Wellar. So she's the head of your organization? A look of disgust passed over his face. She is, but not by our choice. You see, Commander, we are all permanent indentured servants to her and the syndicate she runs. Anya blew air through her teeth. Permanently indentured? Don't you mean slaves? Velasky nodded. Yes, that is another way to say it. Anya went on. Come on, Captain, you look like a big boy who can handle himself. How is it that little old Velar has you and your men under her fingers? Captain Velasky reached up to his neck, slowly, apparently, so as not to alarm any of them. Pulling down his shirt collar, he revealed the strange electronic device looped around his neck Poe had glimpsed before. A Domitian collar. You've seen these, I presume? Poe shook her head, but Ayala said, I have. If you try to take it off, it kills you, right? He nodded. Ayala turned to Poe. The Domitian collar is an old imperial tech that was banned soon after the destruction of my world. After the thousand worlds witnessed the horrors of the Belen diaspora, public tolerance for barbaric technology like this lessened. The Imperials don't use them now, as far as I know. Only slavers. Velasky released his shirt collar, concealing the Domitian device. 
and not even all slavers use them, but Guelar has few scruples and will not hesitate to do whatever she feels is necessary to keep control over her people. And those people now include your captain, Commander Poe. The pit in Poe's stomach returned. They're captured? She nearly stood up, but forced herself to remain calm. No need to clue Velasky as to how she really felt. Yes, don't worry, they're safe. They're far too valuable just to kill. The government on destiny is starting to crack down on the slave trade, so it's become increasingly harder for Huelar to kidnap her regular rotation of vagrants and young single women. She's had to resort to kidnapping off-worlders, and, given your ship's new reputation, she felt it would be a singular opportunity to nearly double her workforce by kidnapping all of you. It didn't make sense. Why in the world was Velara's second-in-command on the Phoenix, telling her all about the inner workings of his boss's operation? So, Velasky, why are you here? Why are you telling me all of this? Simple, Commander. We are slaves, and we want out. You and your ship represent the first opportunity to escape that we have seen in years. If we don't get out now with the Phoenix, we never will. Anya Grace blew the bangs out of her eyes. Bullshit. It's a trap, Poe. Velasky shook his head. I assure you, Commander Poe, that I want nothing more than to see Wellar hung, and to be a free man again. She's had me under her thumb for over ten years. Poe shrugged. Why haven't you left before now? You've got ships? Surely you could just find some place to remove that collar and then be on your way, said Poe. The Domitian Collar is a devilish little device, Commander. If I try to remove it myself, or any other technician for that matter, without the proper deactivation passcode, it sends a little signal to the tiny speck at the end of this fiber optic. He indicated a minuscule little transparent line that ran from the collar into the back of his neck. If I even try to pull this out, the little chip at the end will... Let's just say that even the milligram of explosive embedded within it will have quite a deleterious effect on the men's head. Anya made a face. Poe said, I see. And if you were to just leave the system? I presume it has some sort of timed proximity response? Velasky nodded. Unless Willar is with me, I have roughly twenty-four hours to get back to the planet. Roughly? Grace looked skeptical. Yes, roughly, he eyed her. Willar never tells us exactly how long. She feels it inspires a certain amount of terror to never know exactly when one's head will explode. It's kept her workforce in line for years. He turned back to Poe. But that's not all. For many of us, she knows where our families live. Mine is still on destiny and she has hinted that there might be similar devices hidden somewhere in our homes as well. If we try to escape, not only do we die, but we simultaneously lose our loved ones as well. Villar's insidious schemes turned to Poe's stomach. But no, it was all too convenient. So, let me guess. You want us to lead another mission down to the surface to not only rescue our people, but to rescue yours? Velasky nodded. Something like that, yes. Poe pressed further. And why us? Why haven't you just overthrown Valar on your own? Why now? Because, Captain, if my men and I were to try a full frontal assault on Willar and her faithful slaves, we'd be instantly killed with the flip of a switch. But if some of your marines lead the assault and distract her from us, we'll have a much better chance. With her distracted, I can hit the critical Domitian infrastructure in her command center and set us all free. Grace stood up, shaking her head. He's full of shit, Commander. He's pulling your chain. Sounds like a ploy to capture yet more of us. And then, when we've only got a skeleton crew, that's when they attack and enslave the rest of us and take the ship. Well, fuck that. Poe's eyes narrowed. Why is our shuttle full of your armed men? Velasky nodded. As I said, they are for my protection, and yours. 
and they are at your disposal in this operation. I have discussed this with them, and they've all agreed that the risk is worth it. Are their families at risk, too? Some, yes. Not all. Poe didn't know what to do, or even if she could trust him. Anya clearly thought they couldn't, and for good reason. The men could be lying. The device around his neck could be a prop, and he could be luring them all down to a similar fate to the first landing party. So what's your plan, then? Just waltz into Valar's headquarters, shut the devices off, and be on your way? It won't be quite that simple. But we have the element of surprise. She is not expecting this. Not in a million years. She can't understand this. Understand what? Poe shifted in her seat. Velasky looked into her eyes and rested a clenched fist on the conference table. That we are willing to risk our lives, and the lives of our families, for freedom. He pounded the fist once for emphasis. Poe watched his fist, his eyes, his legs, anything to read his body language, to try and discern his true intentions. Has anyone tried before? Just a few, and they died horribly. But it was always the new ones and the single ones, the lone freighter pilot with no attachments, the newly captured merchant who didn't know any better. Surely, Commander, you can understand the stakes involved when there's more than one life on the line, especially when those lives are young. Commander, I have two children at home that I haven't seen in ten years. Charred little bodies flashed into Poe's mind, and she shook the image from her head. Her eyes drilled into Velasquez. Could he know? Was it possible? Had he studied her past and found the one thing that might let him in? That might get her to trust him? Just a mention of his made-up little children and he'd be in her good graces? No, it wasn't possible. A motley crew of slavers on destiny would not have access to Imperial fleet records. Unless Trajan had sent Valar all of their personnel files. Unlikely, but... Poe didn't put it past the man. He'd gone to great lengths to arrange the ill-fated battle at the shipyards. Doing something like this would be almost inconsequential. She decided to just confront the possibility head-on, maybe put the men on edge. Did Trajan put you up to this? A look of surprise covered Velasquez's face. Admiral Trajan? Well, yes, he did. Poe raised her eyebrows at his confession, but he continued. Soon after you escaped Earth, he sent out private messages to all his contacts with the syndicates. Willar received one, and I can only assume that others on Destiny got similar messages. Since soon after your landing party arrived, it was ambushed, but not by us. Poe watched his eyes. They darted between her and Anya, who paced back and forth nearby, perhaps in an attempt to put the man on edge. He ignored Ensign Ayala entirely. Had he never seen a Belenite before? What did Trajan promise you? Velasky snorted. <laughs> what else? A very large payment and possibly your ship. He was vague on that point, but he was clear that if we took your entire crew as slaves we would not only be highly paid, but that the Empire would look the other way on the slave trade in this sector, giving Huelar and the other syndicates free reign. Poe pressed on. And Valar believes him? She is wary, but this is too good of an opportunity to pass up. If we refuse, the Empire swoops in and takes her out. As simple as that. We've only let her live this long, because she is willing to do the odd job here and there for the Empire. We're not the November clan, or any of the larger, wealthier syndicates. We're small fry, and Trajan knows it. And he's had other business on destiny, so the rumor goes. The rumor? What sort of business? Anya, still pacing, turns to Poe. You can't trust him, Megan. Let's just take him and their men hostage, and their ships, and use them as bargaining chips. Poe nodded. The thought had crossed my mind. She turned back to Velasky. Any reason why I shouldn't? Velasky cleared his throat and leaned back in his chair. Your captain will die. The landing party will die. Willar has no compunction about putting a bullet in their heads, if she think it will encourage you to cooperate. For now they are safe, 
but if she doesn't immediately get what she wants, she will start killing your crew one by one until only Captain is left. And then she'll just call Trajan and hand Mercer over to the Empire if she can't get you to come down with a handful of crew. So she's expecting you to return with a shuttle full of Phoenix crew members? As more slaves? Yes. Those men in the shuttle were under her orders to secure the Phoenix once I leave with another group of you. The enormity of their problem weighed on Poe. Refuse Velasky and her crew members die. Trust him and risk all of them dying. Or worse, living for the rest of their lives as slaves to some small-time syndicate on a dustbin world called Destiny. Commander Poe, this is the bridge. A voice sounded over the comm. Poe moved over to the wall to access the comm receiver there, out of the other's hearing range. Go ahead. Sir, we're not sure, but we think sensors have picked up a large gravitic signal. Something big just entered orbit around Destiny. It's, uh, it's hard to tell for sure, but the signal matches the signature of the Caligula. Damn. They weren't even going to wait for Villar to uphold her end of the deal. And they were probably going to give the woman more than she had bargained for. Chapter 6 When Jake woke up, his head hurt. A lot. He struggled to open his heavy eyelids, and reached up to rub them when he realized he couldn't even reach his face. He pulled. A chain tugged back at his wrist. Shit. Forcing his eyes halfway open, he peered around. Alessandro lay next to him, chained to the wall, and against the other wall lay the heaping forms of Avery and Suarez, similarly bound. They had the same collars around their necks as the medic, and Villar's two grunts, and a little dribble of dried blood marked both of the men's necks. He reached up to his own neck and felt the collar there. A thin wire led from the collar to the back of his neck, and he winced in pain as he realized that it ran under his skin. That's when the headache kicked in. He could almost feel the end of the wire sticking deeply into his brain. He wondered exactly how far it went in. Wrapping his fingers around the wire, he tugged at it, wincing as the pain of one hundred tiny daggers seared into his head. Pulling harder, he grit his teeth and prepared to yank the thing out before pausing to consider his actions. With no idea what might be at the end of the wire or what it could be wrapped around, he decided to let it be. He looked back down at the sleeping forms of his crew, and a sudden realization dawned on him. Ben. Where was Ben? Avery, he whispered as loudly as he dared. Avery, wake up. Bernoulli, Suarez. The others seemed to still be sound asleep, deep under the effects of whatever had been in those canteens. It started to make a little more sense to him now. That room, it was probably a prisoner prep area of some sort where Villar brought her victims to rest, perhaps after a contrived chase. He thought back to the bandits with the guns at the marketplace who had chased them all the way to the compound, and wondered if they had been in on the whole thing. And then, once the unsuspecting prisoners felt somewhat safe in that room, that's when they were given something to drink from the tainted canteens. But Ben... Ben didn't drink. He just set his canteen aside and started confronting Villar, Something Jake should have done himself. His head pounded. He raised a slow, groggy hand up to his face to rub his eyes. What the hell did they do to him? Damn it, Ben was right. He was right all along. The man never trusted anyone, and Jake had believed all along that it was one of his friend's faults. But now, it turned out that if Jake had deferred to Ben's judgment, they'd never be in this mess. Why did I take this command away from him in the first place? His decision to lie to his friends and assume command of the ship started to seem incredibly foolish. Who the hell was he to think he could do a better job than either Ben or Megan? Doc Nichols. The doctor supported him. He approved of his erstwhile decision. He had seen decades of service in the Imperial and Resistance fleets, and he should know a good officer, a good captain, when he saw one. Shouldn't he? Didn't he say that Captain Watson was a friend, but that the man was not one of the most competent of captains? No, those were not his words. He said the captain lacked imagination, initiative, 
drive. Those were things Nichols said he saw in Jake. Well, not so much saw in Jake as didn't see in Ben. And the man was right. For as long as Jake knew his friend, Ben had never been one to creatively think his way out of situations, or to do anything other than quote the regulations. Hence his call sign, Manuel, a semi-racist play on the word manual. Looking around the room, he tried to focus his mind on his situation. Yes, time to get his bearings, know his surroundings so he could formulate a plan, get them out of there. That's what he did, right? That was his talent, getting out of trouble? He sure as hell could get into it, so he must have some experience getting out of it. Each brick wall was studded with rings, through which the chains that bound all of their arms and legs passed. A table was against the third wall, next to which rested a set of shelves that held several more menacing-looking collars like the one around his neck. A set of tools lay scattered around on the table, including a scalpel, several small drills with multiple bloody detachments, and one end of the table looked as if someone had bled heavily on it, and someone had hastily tried to clean it away with mixed success. The fourth wall held only a door. No other openings into the room could be seen, not even so much as a ventilation shaft. Still wincing in pain, Jake struggled to his knees and attempted to raise his body upright in a kneeling position. His head spun and he lay back down. Avery, he croaked. Yeah. Jake glanced over at the Marine whose head was in his shackled hands. You, uh, okay? Avery rolled his head around and Jake could hear a succession of distinct pops from his neck. Yeah, I'll manage. He fingered the wire sticking into his neck and started tugging on it. What the hell is this? I don't know. I wouldn't uh, mess with it, though. We've got no idea what's at the end of it. Avery scowled, but released the wire and stood up with a grunt. He wavered on his feet for a moment before steadying himself against the wall. What's the situation, Captain? I just woke up a few minutes before you. Commander mm, Jemez is gone. I haven't seen him. He felt a little sick, but shoved the feeling of nausea deep down inside. Ben was alive. He knew it. The man was built of stronger stuff than he was. Avery examined the iron brackets on the wall, testing their strength. You think the Phoenix knows we're captured? Jake shook his head. I've got no idea how long we've been out. Feels like a few hours, but it could have been days for all we know. The other two men started groaning. Jake reached out and wiggled Alessandra's boot. Hey, Bernoulli. Hey, wake up. Time to get moving. Alessandro opened one eye, the same side as his half-mustache. Have you brought me on vacation, friend, he said groggily. Jake couldn't help but chuckle. Yeah, best vacation ever. No obligations. Hold up with the three most stand-up guys you could hope for, and I imagine there will be room service later. Suarez grunted. He sat up and touched the collar around his neck with his good hand, the other arm still wrapped tightly to his chest supposedly to keep him from moving the shoulder. Jake wondered if they had gone ahead and operated on it, since it appeared their hosts were not planning on returning them to the Phoenix any time soon. The Phoenix. He hoped that Megan had the sense to keep the pirates off the ship, no matter what offers of help or threats they made. Suarez wrapped his hands around the wire, sticking into his neck. Bitches aren't gonna collar me, he said. Suarez, no, Jake yelled. But before Avery could reach over to his companion, Suarez yanked on the wire as hard as he could. Pop. Suarez's head snapped at an angle, his eyes screwed up into odd directions, and turned crimson red, and two bursts of blood shot out of his nose. He slumped back to the floor, motionless. Jake's nausea returned, and he doubled over and vomited onto the floor. Avery jerked against the chains to reach toward his friend, but it was no use. And there was no point. Suarez was dead. Commander? Poe shook her head. It was all coming so quickly. The landing team unable to communicate, then Velasquez saying that they were captured as slaves to be sent to work in some godforsaken uranium mine, then the pirate captain claiming a change of heart and that he wanted to help the Phoenix recover her crew, and now the Caligula. The fighter deck conference room seemed to spin around her. She leaned in toward the comm. 
I'll be right up, Ensign. Maintain position, and cut all active scanning of the planet and the orbital space above it. Cut all systems that could give away our position except Gravitix. In fact, lower our position by Z-1000 clicks. Hey, sir, came Ensign Roshenko's reply. She cut the calm and turned back to Velasky, Ayala, and Lieutenant Grace. I'm afraid something has come up. A captain, please follow Ensign Ayala and me to the bridge. Grace? She glanced at Anya, who had risen from her chair in half alarm. A word? She led the woman to the anteroom and spoke in hushed tones. Is your fighter crew ready? Anya whispered back. No, but they're what we've got. They'll hold up in a fight with any pussy-ass pirates. Why, what's up? Poe leaned in close to Anya's ear. The Caligula just shifted into orbit. Shit, breathed Grace. They probably haven't spotted us yet due to our position over the pole, but they will, eventually. Are we fixing for a fight, sir? Anya almost looked eager, but Poe knew better than to fall for the bravado. No, but get your crew ready just in case. She turned back to the waiting Ayala and Velasky. What is the likelihood that they're here just by chance, sir? said Ayala as they made their way to the bridge after Poe had filled them in. Poe glanced sidelong at Velasky, who shook his head. Zero. The atmosphere on the bridge was far tenser than when Poe had left it. The tactical station was a hive of activity as the officers and technicians there scrambled to get a passive sensor reading on the Caligula, and the operations station struggled to coordinate the shutdown of the non-essential systems that might be detectable. Status, said Poe as she approached the command console. She motioned to one of the two marines stationed at the door to stand by Velasky and watch him. Ensign Roshinko looked back at her. We've lowered our altitude, now hovering two thousand clicks above the pole. Science, what's the likelihood that they can read our gravitic signature from wherever they are, given our position over the pole? A young man at the science station hesitated. It's, uh, hard to say, sir. Best guess, Ensign, she eyed the man. Not quite a boy, but young nonetheless. Probably a Los Alamos volunteer. The weapons lab had sent a steady stream of scientists to be officers in the resistance fleet back in its heyday, and this man fit the bill. He looked a little awkward in his uniform, as if unused to formal authority. Uh, maneuvering gravitics certainly leave a smaller trace than shifting gravitics, sir. Uh, um, the energy consumption is smaller by several orders of magnitude, but it's still a gravitic signal, after all. The ionic and electromagnetic interference of the pole might mask us, but then again it might not. Poe grit her teeth. No, that was unacceptable. They had to get rid of their gravitic signature. But there were only two ways to do that. Either put on a burst of speed to enter a stable orbit, or... Ms. Roshenko, lower us to the ground. Ensign Roshenko spun around again. Sir? You heard me. Take us to the ground. Quickly. Velasky still hovered near, under the watchful eye of his marine escort. Commander, the admiral knows you're here somewhere. Down there you'll be a sitting duck for whatever he decides to throw at you. She didn't even look at him. She was still too angry that it was his syndicate that got the phoenix into their precarious position, in spite of his assurances that he just wanted out like them. They know we're at destiny, but they don't know where. If we can get down to the surface before they find us, it'll buy us some time. And when we get down there, are we just going to twiddle our thumbs while the Admiral decides whether he'd rather take us out with nukes or with conventional torpedoes? Velasky had turned to her in a confrontational manner. Poe didn't even look at him, but stared straight at the view screen, watching as the distant surface loomed larger. Control yourself, Captain. This is the only way we buy time without directly engaging them, and we are in no shape to do that at the moment. Helm, are we moving? Yes, sir, halfway to the surface, said Roshenko. A science officer cleared his throat. Poe struggled to remember his name. Uh, sir, um, there is no surface there, it's ocean. She spun around to him. It's not ice? It looks like the northern hemisphere is in the last few weeks of summer, and nearly all the ice has melted. The young ensign looked as if he loathed being the bearer of yet more bad news to the frazzled commander. Poe steeled herself. She must not look frazzled. She had to appear in control and in charge and on top of things and put together and... Take us down anyway. Put us under the water and then maneuver us under one of the chunks of ice if there are any. The entire bridge crew turned to look at her. 
Get to work, people, you heard me. She didn't even look at them. A science officer hemmed and hawed a little. Um, sir, these ships weren't exactly designed to go underwater. She walked up to talk to him more directly. Any reason why we can't? She peered at his name insignia. Ensign Zabo? Ensign Zabo shrugged. Well, for one, the, the hull was meant to withstand positive internal pressure. If we go much more than a few meters underwater, the pressure differential will go negative. A lot. The hull wasn't designed for that. It's not even in the specs what it will... Ensign, it's not in the specs because no one has ever needed it. We need it. I'd reckon that our hull can withstand the vacuum of space that it can handle a little external pressure. He shook his head. Uh, yes, but, but... Sir, the pressure differential between space and us is only one atmosphere, with the force gradient pointing outward. Underwater, that pressure will be many times higher than atmosphere, and the force gradient points inward. There's no telling what will happen. She sighed, quietly, so that the young man wouldn't hear. Thank you, Ensign Zabo. Take us under, Ensign Roshenko. Keep us as close to the surface as possible. And get us under ice. Nearly there, sir. Another ten clicks. Decelerating now. Five. Four. Three. She began to slow the countdown. Sensors? Still no sign of the Caligula? She kept her gaze on the view screen, which displayed the vast, ice-pocked ocean now surrounding them. None, sir. Well, there's only so much passive scanners can pick up, came the reply from Tactical. She wasn't even sure who had responded. It felt like she was in a tunnel, just her and the view screen, watching as the ocean reared up at them. The voices around her faded into the background, and she braced herself for the moment the hull would contact the water. She wondered how the gravitic compensators would handle it. A gentle wave, and it was over. They were floating on the surface, but steadily sinking. "'Push us under, Roshenko, she said, fighting to keep her voice steely and calm. Glancing at Roshenko, she saw her hand shake as she touched the controls that would take them under the surface. She walked up behind her and rested a hand on her shoulder. "'We'll be fine.' she said with a small smile. She desperately wanted to believe it. Roshenko's shoulder felt tense. Poe didn't blame her, and yet also inwardly marveled at the ensign's steely resolve, in spite of her shaking hands. Any other ensign fresh out of the academy would have broken under the pressure about two battles ago. The science officer, Sabo, called out, Two atmospheres of pressure, sir. We are now past the hull rating.' The picture on the front wall changed as the water engulfed the camera on the front of the hull, replacing their view of the vast fields of ice islands with a blue, turbulent vortex pierced by low, streaming shafts of weak sunlight that managed to shine through the maelstrom of water. Zabo continued. Four atmospheres. They watched the maelstrom of water and light turn darker. The deck plates moaned and the girders behind the walls creaked. Six atmospheres. Eight Ten, sir, Zabo began, but Megan cut him off. Maneuver us under that ice sheet, Ensign, said Poe. The entire bridge crew waited with bated breath as the water began to settle, and Ensign Roshenko, a bit calmer now with Poe's hand on her shoulder, pushed the ship under one of the larger sheets of ice. Something snapped behind one of the walls, making everyone on the bridge jump. But no explosions, no water rushing in. After another minute, it was all over. The water on the view screen cleared and Roshenko breathed a sigh of relief. Who's there, sir? Poe turned to the science station, shooting a quizzical look at Ensign Zabo. He studied his console, tapping a few buttons. Hull is holding, sir. Pressure at twelve atmospheres at the bottom of the ship, two at the top. A collective sigh swept through the bridge. Poe felt like a Caligula-sized weight had just been lifted from her shoulders. She'd done it. For now, at least. Poe backed up to the captain's chair, and as she did so, her mind turned back to her friends down, no, now up, on the surface. She had absolutely no desire to make that chair her own. Good job, everyone. Now, let's get to work trying to detect that ship, and our people. I want some answers. Captain Titus leaned over the command console, studying the readout. He glanced up at the one-eyed man sitting in his chair, the captain's chair, we have shifted into orbit, sir. He looked over at the tactical station. Any sign of the Phoenix? The lieutenant sitting over the technicians at the station shook his head. Only about a dozen or so of the merchant frigates. 
Admiral Trajan, who had remained uncharacteristically quiet for the past several minutes, finally spoke. They won't be in orbit, Captain. They're far too cautious for that. Captain Titus felt his brow furrow in surprise. Oh? He turned back to tactical. Does Destiny have a moon I'm not seeing? The officer at tactical shook his head, but Trajan responded for him, apparently already quite familiar with the Destiny system. Titus wondered again what had brought him here before. No, no moon, Captain. Check the poles. He turned in his chair to face tactical. What's the interference like at the poles? The officer studied his readout. A heavy interference, sir. Uh, ionic storms are generating a significant EM noise signal. Trajan nodded and looked back at Titus, who kicked himself for not thinking of it before Trajan. Yet another instance of the Admiral making him look foolish in front of his own bridge crew. Incline our orbit to take us over the South Pole, Captain. If they're not there, take us over the North. Yes, sir. And he nodded to the helmsman in confirmation. Turning back to Trajan, he cocked his head. Do you suppose Villar and her gang could have secured the ship by now? Trajan paced the bridge. I doubt it, Captain. Mercer is far more capable than you give him credit for. But who knows? Maybe our work here is already done. The helmsman announced. Orbit adjusted, sir. We'll pass over the southern continent in a few minutes. Titus glanced over at tactical. Engage all visuals, and infrared cameras. Cover every portion of the sky. They could be above us, below us. I don't want to just stumble on top of them and blow our surprise. Yes, sir. Cameras engaged, came the reply. For once, the Admiral seemed to be in a pensive mood, and the bridge fell back into silence. Whenever Trajan was present, Titus didn't feel like it was his purview to initiate conversation. He glanced at the Admiral. His one eye was shut— the gash over the other half of his face had begun to heal, though the man had scoffed at the idea of going to sickbay to have the doctor look at it. The man was fiercely independent. Titus surmised that the admiral refused to believe he needed anyone around him, including the doctor, including Titus. He suspected that every one of the bridge crew was a huge disappointment to the man, who probably would have staffed the bridge with robots if he had had his druthers. Several silent minutes later, the helmsman spoke up again. Now passing over the southern continent, we'll be at the pole in fifteen seconds. Titus glanced at tactical again. The man shook his head. After another minute, the helmsman cleared his throat. And we've passed the polar region. Nothing, sir. No sign of the phoenix, said Captain Titus. Trajan steepled his hands in front of his chin. Scan all orbits of destiny. Look for a debris cloud. You think Villar might have just destroyed them? Asked Titus. No, I don't. But we may as well exhaust the possibility. Another silent two minutes passed, and the tactical officer spoke up again. No debris cloud so far, sir. And we'll be approaching the northern polar region shortly, sir, said the helmsman. Trajan murmured to himself. Mercer, mercer... Where have you gotten yourself to? Titus cleared his throat. Ahem, <clears throat> you don't suppose they've landed somewhere? Hidden themselves under some foliage or covered the ship with camouflage or the like? It is possible, Trajan said, and he nodded. Indeed, if we don't find them in orbit, either as an intact ship or a debris cloud, we are forced to consider the possibility— Either that or they've flown out to hide behind one of the gas giant planets, but that is unlikely. He sat pensively a few more moments before standing up briskly out of his seat. Come. Open a channel to Villar. You'll find I've placed the appropriate frequency on your console display. The comm officer's eyes darted over to a section of his console, and he nodded in recognition when he found it. Channel open, sir. Villar of the... Urensis Syndicate, this is Admiral Trajan of the Imperial Fleet. Is now a good time to talk? His voice sounded perfectly polite, as if the man actually cared, as if he were calling on an old friend. Titus realized the man could hit all the right notes, pitch perfect, without actually feeling any sentiment behind what he was saying. A true psychopath, indeed. The main speaker on the bridge came to life. This is Velar. 
Greetings, Admiral Trajan. Welcome to Destiny. I must say I hadn't expected you so soon. Is there a problem? Trajan smiled. I was about to ask the same of you, Valar. Tell me, do you know the whereabouts of the NPQR Phoenix? Vague, inaudible noises muffled in the background before Valar replied. The last I saw of her, she was hovering over the northern polar region. They seemed to think they could avoid being seen there. Trajan glanced at the sensor officer. The man shook his head. We're passing the North Pole now, sir, and still no sign of them. Admiral Trajan began a slow pace around the command console, and Titus stepped back to avoid being caught in the middle again. The vulture was swirling. They apparently have moved on, Trajan replied. Tell me, Velar, do you suppose they were warned of my arrival? The response was immediate. Absolutely not. I run a tight ship here, Admiral. None of my people would dare betray me. I don't doubt it, he said, cutting her off. Still using the Domitian collar, I suppose? Barbaric, but yes, it does get the job done. He continued pacing. Do you have any guests there? We do. The former captain, his first officer, and the chief engineer. And two marines, she added. One alive and one dead. A dangerous smile broadened on Trajan's face, which combined with the cavernous pit of the eye would be enough to give a brave man nightmares. Quite a quarry you've got yourself, madam. And does our deal still stand? We get to keep them and the rest of the crew, right? She sounded nervous. Titus smiled inwardly. She had every right to be. If it were up to him, he'd bomb the entire slaver complex without any further conversation. Yes, it still stands. But we have no deal if the Phoenix has escaped with nearly her entire crew still aboard. Titus could almost hear Valar sweat. Understood, Admiral. I'll get the word out. My people will find them if you don't. Not to worry. The Phoenix is as good as yours. Trajan's pace came to a head back at the captain's chair. It is mine, Valar. Don't forget that. Of course, Admiral. I, I didn't mean otherwise. I know what you meant, Valar. Trajan looked peeved. Just hear me now. If that ship is not found in the next twelve hours... I'm afraid our deal may have to be altered. A long pause. Yes, Admiral. They'll are out. Trajan turned to Titus. Captain, prepare a squadron of fighters to patrol the orbits of destiny. I want that ship. Yes, sir. Titus spun on his heel to motion to the wing commander behind him and pointed at him, indicating he carry out the Admiral's orders. Calm, officer. Trajan said, peering over at Ensign Evans. Yes, Admiral. You'll find another set of carrier frequencies there on your panel. I need to speak to Dr. Stone. Ensign Evans studied his console and nodded. Yes, sir. Entering frequencies now. Titus could hear the Ensign mutter into his headset, talking with some communications operator on the other end, when finally a sterile voice sounded over the speakers. This is Dr. Velasquez said the female voice without a hint of emotion. Dr. Stone is indisposed at the moment. May I pass along a message? The look in Trajan's eye could melt right through a solid composite metal hull. Indisposed. He had better hope he is indisposed with research, Dr. Velasquez, and not his hobbies. I've come to retrieve the Cybernetic Institute's first deliverable. I assume it is ready. With hesitation, the voice continued. I... I'm not entirely sure. Please stand by, Admiral. Dr. Velasquez's voice cut out, leaving an uncomfortable silence reigning on the bridge. Trajan was seething, that much was clear. Titus only rarely had seen the Admiral actually angry. Usually the man was calm and collected, even as he carried out soulless, horrific acts. Titus cleared his throat. Sir, would it help if I sent down a contingent of— No, Captain, it would not— I already have an entire squadron of marines and technical staff down there as a permanent reminder to the good doctor of our arrangement. And that arrangement? Titus trailed off as the eye came to rest on him. Is none of your concern at the moment, Captain, Trajan replied icily. Titus clammed up immediately, breathing a sigh of relief as the speaker blared to life again, saving him from the conversation. 
Admiral, this, uh, this is Dr. Stone. The voice was high and nervous. I have g good news, Admiral. Lymphatic response is normalized, and the protease catalase enzyme response is now off the charts. The next step is to normalize the synaptic response in the cortex and stabilize the electromagnetic response of the... Doctor, doctor, doctor. Do you think you can fool me? Trajan asked dangerously. Uh, ex excuse me, Admiral? The man sounded like he had swallowed his tongue. I know about you, doctor. My men have described to me your... habits. And I've looked the other way because until now you've delivered... But if I find that the Empire can no longer trust you with its science funding, you will find that I have no problem cutting off the dead weight, if you know what I mean. But, but Admiral, I assure you that— Trajan stood up and interrupted. Do you have the first deliverable ready? Yes, yes, I do, yes, at least a, a part of it. Part of it, Trajan repeated in annoyance. Yes. You wanted to, to test it, correct? Well, it is definitely in the, the testing stage. I can't deliver the amount requested, b b but... The man hesitated, the nervousness in his voice coming loud and clear through the speaker. But would point one kilos be sufficient? Trajan pursed his lips and sat back down again. Will that be enough to perform a dozen or so tests back at the testing center on Corsica? Yes, more than enough. I'll, I'll, I'll package it up right away and have it ready for you whenever... Very well, Doctor. The Emperor will be most pleased with your progress, I'm sure. He follows your research personally. Did you know that? Uh, d d no, sir, I, I d d didn't, the man stammered. Titus imagined a half-balding man in a white lab coat with flop sweat running down his temples. Oh, yes. He does, indeed. Your research is extremely important to him. He is a man of science, after all. Trajan sat down and his voice took on a softer, more reasoned tone, apparently trying to calm the scientist down. An enlightened man he is. Emperor Maximilian was still in his graduate program in biology when his father, Emperor Justinian, died and he inherited the throne. I assure you he understands what it's taken— to make the great strides you've made. D does he? Dr. Stone was starting to sound a little more at ease. Th then, uh, perhaps I can ask a, a small favor to help the research along. I seem to be running low on subjects. Trajan stirred in his seat, a look of annoyance crossing his face. And what of the last shipment of Terran girls I arranged last year? A long pause. Used? Trajan sighed. Very well. The commander there will send his men to the streets and pick out some new ones. How many? Stone hesitated. Twenty? Twenty missing girls is not easily covered up, doctor. Uh, on C Corsica, sure, came the curt reply. But on D Destiny, that many d disappear every week. The slavers are quite active here. Trajan nodded slowly. Done. Anything else, Doctor? Th that should be it. I await your shuttle to transfer the deliverable. Excellent. Trajan out. The Admiral glanced up at Titus as if sensing a question. You look concerned, Captain. Tell me what's on your mind. Titus cleared his throat and swallowed, not wanting to raise the subject on the bridge in front of the crew, but the Admiral seemed eager to address his questions especially the most obvious question of all. Sir, he began, choosing his words carefully, do we... that is, does the Empire engage in kidnapping? Kidnapping? Trajan looked genuinely surprised. Kidnapping? Of course not, Captain. Though I can imagine how you'd be left with that impression. No, the Empire does not kidnap. Do we reassign children of dissidents? Yes, naturally. Do we send entire families to the re-education centers? When the corruption runs deep in a family? Yes. Do we kidnap? No, most assuredly. Yes. Well, Titus began. Then what was the conversation about, you're wondering? Titus nodded. Yes. A good question, with an easy answer. You see, 
The doctor is working on a special vaccine to prevent an incurable new disease that is raging through the frontier worlds. He requires subjects to test it on. The most vulnerable to the disease are the weak, the destitute, the street people, so naturally they are the ones we'd want to help first. We only bring in those most at risk for their own good. He lowered his chin and stared at Titus. Isn't that rather beneficent of us? Yes. Yes, it is, sir. But what did Stone mean when he said the previous girls were... used? Trajan nodded. He is a scientist, Captain, and scientists have such a... utilitarian way with language. I'm sure he just meant that, as a testing resource, the pool of subjects has been used up. What he probably should have said is that all the girls are now immune from the sickness that will surely sweep through this world within a few months, years at the latest. I see, said Titus, unsure of what to make of it. The explanation sounded plausible, but he had never heard of a sickness sweeping through the frontier worlds. Trajan nodded as if reading his mind. Yes, the existence of the threat has been classified to keep hysteria from spreading. No sense in allowing panic to set in. No, Captain, the Emperor would much prefer to keep this under wraps, to cure the epidemic before it ever really gets started, and surely before it becomes common knowledge. Titus inclined his head in acquiescence. Very well, sir. Shall I prepare the shuttle, then? Trajan stood up and straightened his uniform. Thank you, Captain. I was just about to ask. Such foresight. Really, I could not ask for a better assistant. He turned to the rest of the bridge, raising his voice. Or a better crew. He said something similar the week before, praising the bridge crew for all to hear. Just before he blew the chief engineer's brains out, Trajan turned back to Titus. I'll be in my quarters. Find that ship, Captain. Aye, sir, he replied as Trajan stalked out the rear door of the bridge. He turned to the wing commander. Prepare a shuttle. Send it to the Cybernetic Institute down on the planet and receive a delivery of... a deliverable. How odd. A vaccine being developed at an institute for cybernetics. It didn't add up. But it wasn't his job to add it all up. It was his job to find the phoenix. He turned his attention back to the console and got to work. The deck plate creaked, and Senator Galba held his breath. He'd heard the klaxons, and the announcements to man emergency stations, but there was never any mention of what was going on. Turning back to the half-disassembled console panel, he poked his probe back into the circuitry. It had been so long since he had worked with electronics. Forty years? Forty-five? His father was insistent that he learn a trade, an insurance, just in case the family fortunes fell, and so he spent two years as an apprentice tech in the Imperial Senate office building. He grinned to himself. That's when he had bagged his first woman. She was young, like himself, tall, shy, and lit up when he casually tossed a compliment her way. Ah, the way they'd steal away to that utility closet during lunch. The deck plate groaned again, and he glanced up at the walls and ceiling nervously. The ship seemed to be protesting some kind of strain, some intense pressure. With the press of a button, he flipped on the power to the terminal and navigated to the ship's tactical situation software, hoping to see the source of the moaning of the deck plates. <laughs> it reminded him of the tall, shy tech girl. She had always moaned. Not like Willow, who cursed like a marine whenever she got frisky. Within minutes, he found the source of the ship's problems. About ten meters of ice water covering the hull. What in the world was the captain thinking? The rebels must be hiding. But who could they be hiding from? There was only one answer to that question. And so he shifted to his new task. If he could force the phoenix to come out of hiding, the game would be up. All it would take was a simple power build-up on one of the hull's gravitic plates. That would serve both of his purposes— disrupt gravitics, and possibly cause a hull breach, forcing them to surface. Within minutes it was done. Careful to make the build-up escape attention of any engineer who might be monitoring, he set the charging rate low. It would take hours. Maybe days. 
But the damn thing would blow eventually, and then it would all be over. The plan would continue, and he could retire to his Corsican beach house. Finally. The door slid open without a warning. Damn it, he thought he'd locked it. Need any help, Senator? Wonderful. He snapped his head around toward the door and saw Private Ling's bruised and battered face. A smile tugged at the Marine's lips. Ah, what in blazes are you talking about? said Galba. Ling stepped into the cramped utility room. It struck me a few minutes ago. You look exactly like that one senator. You know, the one who heads up the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. The one trying to improve Empire-Old Earth relations. Galba rolled his eyes and turned back to the console, stuffing a few wires back into their places and shutting the back panel. Now you're seeing things, Private. But don't worry. He turned back to face the young man and flashed a big smile. I get it all the time. In fact, he grunted as he stood up and leaned in closer. You'd be surprised how much pussy I can get when I impersonate a senator. He waggled his eyebrows at the young man as he stepped toward the door. So, so you're not Senator Glib... Gliba? The young man looked positively disappointed. Good. <laughs> Alas, my friend. The door opened and Galba stepped through. But if I see him... I'll let you know. So long. He turned and hurriedly walked away before the Marine could change his mind about his identity. Something would have to be done about it, of course. He supposed he could tell Willow, see if she could finger the Marine for the previous explosion. She had mentioned last night in bed that the XO was hot on the saboteur's trail. Hey, stop. Galba froze and turned his head cautiously. Private Ling stood behind him, arm extended. You forgot something. Galba paced back and took his tool bag from the offered hand. Thanks, soldier, he said, nodding once before turning to resume his retreat. No problem, Ling called out after him. He turned the corner and quickened his pace through the common area, past other Imperial Marines sprawled out on couches and chairs, and headed for the stairs. Jake was numb. The image of the twin blasts of blood streaming out of Suarez's nose refused to leave his mind. Neither would the image of the eyes jerking into an unnatural, twisted gaze. He didn't get much time to dwell on the death immediately afterward, as Villar had rushed in and, using some device in her pocket, made the rest of their heads nearly explode in pain. It didn't kill them, of course, but Jake dropped to his knees with his head between his hands and writhed. The pain lasted for what felt like hours, but was probably only a few seconds. Time seemed to dilate with incomprehensible pain, it appeared. First lesson, don't touch the collar, said Valar as she waved two of her guards over to collect Suarez's body. As they dragged the limp, ghoulishly staring form out the door, she continued, Second lesson, do exactly what I tell you and you will be rewarded. Disobey and you'll be punished, severely and without delay. That jolt I just gave you was but a taste, a sample, if you will. Don't make me actually punish you. She smiled. It was an ugly, smug smile. My people will find us, and they will take you down, bitch. Jake croaked. Oh, I doubt that. Captain Velasky is on board the Phoenix as we speak. He should be joining us shortly with another group of senior officers and marines, too rescue you. She laughed. And after that group is subdued, your ship will be mine for the taking. Chew on that as you spend your first day of the rest of your life in my uranium mine. Where's Ben? Why is he not with us? She fingered the hidden device in her pocket. He was not as cooperative as you. I had to keep him isolated. Jake bared his teeth and tried to keep the snarl out of his voice. I swear to you, if you hurt him, I'll rip your fucking throat out. A laugh was her only reply. She turned to leave but glanced back at Jake with menace in her eye while she patted the bulge in her pocket. Don't tempt me, Mercer. The door closed behind her. A tiny trail of blood marked the path where Suarez's body had been dragged. Another body. Another one of his decisions had led to another cold, lifeless body. His head sank down in his hands. Not another one. How much longer could he keep this charade up? 
Why not just throw the responsibility onto Ben when they all escaped and let him deal with the body count? Let him make the hard decisions. He'd be good enough, wouldn't he? He glanced around at Alessandro and Avery. The scientist looked to be in shock, and the Marine looked like he was suppressing a rising rage. Avery? The Marine grunted. I'm going to kill the bastards, he said. I'm going to wrap ten of these things around her neck, set them to the highest setting, and then shove my fist down her throat. He set to work examining the chains around his wrists, looking for a way to unlock them. I know. Avery, she'll pay. But first we've got to get out of here. Alessandro, who hadn't said a word the entire time, looked up at him with dazed eyes. You really think we'll get out of here? Jake forced a stoic look, setting his jaw and nodding. We have to, friend. You want to die here? I sure as hell don't. Come on, buddy, it's just another chess game. We've just got to find their weaknesses and then catch them off guard. Just like you've done to me every morning for the past few weeks. He tried on a grim smile. It felt false and flimsy, but it was all he had. Fuck Villar. If you say so, friend. Alessandro started fingering his demission collar, searching for any kind of functionality on it. Careful there, Bernoulli, said Jake. You must have some kind of access support or settings panel. That's probably run remotely. Alessandro nodded. Sure, but uh, any device will have manual factory resets and the calibration buttons. Well, yeah, any normal device, sure, but these aren't exactly the latest entertainment gadget. A wan smile of defeat passed the man's face. All the same, friend, it's uh, something to do. Jake couldn't argue with that. Nearly an hour later, two guards showed up and ordered them to their feet. With rough manners, they bound their hands together, but removed the chains binding them to the walls. Move, one of them said, pointing with his assault rifle at the door. Jake eyed it, and his reflexes nearly made him leap for the weapon, but he restrained himself. Later, he thought, when their chances were better, when he'd found Ben. They followed the guards out the door, into a long, cluttered hallway. Most of the lights were out, and those that were on flickered pathetically. At the end of the corridor, another door led out onto another passageway, but this one was made of rock, not the wood and brick of the previous one. Clearly they were underground. The damp, musty smell belied the stagnant air and unwashed bodies. How, um, uh, how far down are we? Shut up. No talking. The guard eyed Jake and pointed to his own collar in warning. What, do they prevent us from talking to- and suddenly his head snapped to the side, and he shrieked in pain. The flash subsided as he panted, but the fiery daggers inside his head throbbed for a few more seconds before ebbing slowly away. Yes, said the guard. Well, that's going to put a damper on our escape, he thought. The guard led them to an elevator shaft that plunged them down another several hundred meters or so, and the air soon became thick and warm. The smell of unwashed bodies intensified and rose up to meet him as a dense, ripe wall as they exited the elevator and plunged into a mass of people. Some laid against the walls as if sleeping. Others huddled sitting on the ground in tight, silent circles, while still others fiddled with mining equipment. Both men and women. At least there were no children down here, Jake noted with a feeling of relief, until he saw a young man who couldn't have been more than fifteen sitting up on one of the iron girders spanning the length of the low, jagged rock ceiling. The teen swung one leg back and forth as he eyed the newcomers. The guard pointed to another man, better dressed and not as thin as the other slaves, but gaunt nonetheless. Boss, said the guard to Jake, still pointing at the other man, and then turned to leave with his companion. The man the guard called Boss walked over to them. He walked with a limp, and his bland, pale skin spoke of years beneath the surface. Stringy hair grew in tufts on his balding head and spilled over onto his tattered shirt. But compared to the rest of the people there, he looked veritably healthy. Oh, good. More grunts. Listen, friends, the rule here is that you work. If you make your quota, you earn your food, and I don't get punished. If you don't make your quota, I get punished. And if I get punished, I take it out on you tenfold. Understood? 
Jake, his head still sore from the lightest shock from his collar, decided to risk speaking again. You sleep without a guard? He glowered at the filthy man who advanced on Jake until they were eye to eye. Funny. I don't want to be here any more than you do, so just shut it, okay? We all work, we all live. Simple. And if you think about doing anything to me, you'll have to deal with him. He indicated the boy on the girder and laughed gruffly. Jeremiah doesn't take well to people jostling me around. He picked up a heavy-looking piece of machinery and shoved it into Jake's chest. Take it. I'll teach you how to use it, and then you teach your friends. He glanced up at the other two, pointing at the floor. You there, pick those up. Avery bent over and, with a grunt, picked up a device that looked identical to Jake's. Alessandro hoisted his up as if it were just a small power tool. Jake rolled his eyes at himself as he wondered how the scientist lucked out with the light one. The tools looked identical, but Jake's must have been thirty kilos at least. The man they called Boss dug into his front pocket and extracted a whistle, which he blew. Jake was not prepared for the sound, since the rock walls seemed to magnify the shrill noise and he nearly dropped the hulking piece of mining equipment onto his toes. Break's over! Move! The boss pointed down the long, sloping passageway, and with an assortment of grumbles and groans, the crowd got to its feet and started shuffling down. There must have been nearly one hundred people, Jake guessed. The boy sitting on the girder dropped down to the ground and trailed after another slave, a gaunt, haggard man who glanced back, squinting at the newcomers. Had they been recognized? Impossible. No one here would know anything about the Phoenix or the Resistance. Jake, Avery, and Alessandro followed the boss close behind. Every now and then, a passageway would branch off of the main one, and a small group would peel away and follow it. They passed a few motorized carts, empty, but soon to be filled with valuable ore, which Jake supposed would be hauled to the surface for processing. He wondered why they didn't just dig a large open-air pit and make the process more automated. He didn't feel like asking. People with power couldn't abide questions. At the junction with another branching side passage, the boss stopped and pointed down it, indicating that they follow the winding path. Jake went first, and occasionally a pale, flickering light would come to life on the low ceiling, just as it became too dim to see one more step ahead of him. After nearly five minutes of trudging along with the mining equipment, he ran into the blank wall at the end of the passageway and nearly dropped the heavy load. Careful! The boss smacked Jake hard on the back of the head with a small, tubular electronic device he'd been carrying. The thing is worth more than your life. I can guarantee that. Jake bent his knees and set the equipment down before reaching around to rub his ankle. The tendons had not healed properly ever since the run-in with the surly drunk in the bar on the Earth shipyards. It seemed like ages ago, though he realized it was only a little over two weeks. The boss growled. Hey, this isn't the rest time. Pick it back up. I've got to show you how to use it, and then I've got to go patrol the hallways for slouchers. Alessandro hemmed. Excuse me. How many words? The boss screwed up his face and glared at Bernoulli. Huh? He turned back to Jake. What the hell is he talking about? Alessandro paused as if choosing his words carefully. How many before the shock? Realization dawned on the boss's face. Oh, I don't know. Fifteen or twenty. But after a while you get more. It discourages revolt. Helps the lower class slaves stay demoralized. And you? Bernoulli asked. Me? Ha! The man pulled the cap off the electronic device he held in his hand. I get however many I want. I need them to tell dumbasses like you what to do. He pointed at Jake. You, point that thing at the wall and engage the power. Jake looked down and examined the giant tool in his hand. Indeed, at one end of the grimy object, an array of three metal rods protruded each covered with wires wrapped as if they were massive solenoids. Several large, unmistakable switches dotted what Jake supposed was the top, and the largest one sported a fading symbol that he recognized as the Russian symbol for power on. He flicked it, and when he held it properly around the worn rubber grips, found the trigger. When he pulled it, a blinding beam of ionized electrified gas shot out the front, 
slamming into the rock wall ahead of him. A blast of heat and the occasional white-hot spark of rock hit him in the face. The boss yelled, Careful! You'll lose your eyes if you don't close them and look away. Jake powered the device down and looked at his handiwork while the boss grumbled his disapproval. See, all you did was make a hole in the wall. You've got to take out wedges, small enough to carry, but big enough to make the trip down the passageway worth it. You've got six hours to haul out one ton of ore each. Alessandro's head snapped to glare at the boss. One ton? If I carry twenty kilos per load, that's fifty tr— His head lurched back and he screamed, apparently having hit his word quota. Yes, that's right, smutty pants. Fifty trips. Some people can do it in forty, but— His face descended into a distasteful grin. The women take longer. Sixty, sometimes seventy. But God help me if it ain't fun to watch. Alessandro had set the extractor down and was now furiously rubbing the back of his head, panting and sweating as if he'd run a mile. Jake thought he heard the man mutter an expletive under his breath. He wondered how low they could speak without triggering the caller's sensors. He reached down to pick up Bernoulli's extractor and, tugging at it, realized it was just as heavy as his own. Huh, the scientist must be far stronger than he thought. The boss held up the cylindrical device. This is an omniscanner, which we use as an ore discriminator. When you haul a piece back to the bins, you scan it first. If the concentration of uranium is at least 1%, you drop it in the green bin. If it's less, you dump it in the red bin. Remember, green good, red bad. Got it? They all nodded wearily. Good. Then get to work. He handed the cylinder to Avery and strode back down the passageway and out of sight. Avery turned to Jake. Well, Captain? Jake only grunted. You heard him. Let's get to work. He hoisted the extractor back up to his chest, aimed it at the wall, and imagined the white-hot beam slamming right into the hull of the Caligula. Poe had to sleep. She had lost track, but she was sure it had been over thirty hours since she last slept. Sooner or later, it would catch up with her. During some critical moment, when an error in judgment would mean life or death for every crew member in her charge, she shuddered to think of it. These people trusted her. Ostensibly looked up to her if the rumors were true. She couldn't let them down, and therefore she had to sleep. At least that was what she told herself as she marched down the hall toward her quarters. Since they were currently underwater and the pilots had no way to train, she had left Lieutenant Grace with the bridge, rather than the less experienced Ensign Ayala. She figured a few hours in charge of the whole ship might do the wing commander some good, give her a different view of things. The ship groaned. She could almost hear the deck girders creak as she walked down the hallway, stressed from the incredible forces pushing against the hull. Spaceships were not built like submarines. The science officer told her that the hull plates on the lower decks were likely experiencing over ten times atmospheric pressure, far more than the ship was designed for. Four hours. She allowed herself four hours to sleep. What could happen in four hours? Surely nothing Lieutenant Grace couldn't handle. The woman was capable. She could give her that. In the week or so she'd been wing commander, she had whipped it into better shape than Poe imagined Jake would ever have done had he remained its leader. He was far more suited to command of the ship than he was of the squadron, even though he'd commanded Viper Squadron back on Earth for over two years. She thanked her stars that Captain Watson had chosen him. Collapsing on the bed, she called out to the computer, "'Wake me in four hours,' I acknowledged. The disembodied voice replied. Her mind drifted to various images as she tried to sleep, and before long she realized she was dreaming, though only half so. Klaxons reverberated in her mind as the images of the battle over Earth replayed before her. The Caligula, firing a steady stream of railgun fire. The Fidelius, with its contingent of celebrities, politicians, and other citizens of Earth, blown to pieces by a well-placed torpedo. The turncoat ensign who had fired the fateful shot, before raising a gun to his own head and splattering half the bridge with his brains. The former XO, splayed out on the floor, with a metal rod sticking out of his temple. The klaxons, the yelling, the screaming. It all flooded back to her. That night. That night in San Bernardino. Her home. Their home. She ran down the stairs and peered out the window, looking up at the night sky. 
The bombs showered down. The force of one landing in her street, knocking her away from the window, and hurled her into the opposite wall. She got up, blood in her mouth. She tried to run upstairs, but the blast had collapsed one of the exterior walls into the stairwell. She ran back downstairs and outside, hoping to scale a ladder up to the kids' room. Rick was up there with them. They'd be safe. They'd all be safe until she made it up. She found the ladder and set it up, not heeding the aircraft that shot by overhead, showering that section of the city with bomb after bomb. Why were they attacking so indiscriminately? Didn't they know there were children there? Innocent children that had nothing to do with the resistance? A bomb struck and blasted her with a massive shock wave. She flew off the ladder and into a nearby tree that broke both her fall and her arm. But it didn't matter. The pain didn't matter. The jagged radius bone sticking out of her forearm didn't matter. Fire ravaged the house. What was left of it? She screamed. Oh, how she screamed. She ran toward the burning structure, but a neighbor tackled her and restrained her. Hours later, she entered after the fire crew had snuffed out the dying flames. And she found them. All three of them. Huddled together. It had happened before, and now it happened again, accelerated, pausing at certain moments to etch certain images deeper into her mind. She knew it was a dream, but she couldn't stop the image from replaying. She knelt down and held them. Burned, desiccated bodies are so much lighter than normal healthy ones. It is odd what one thinks about when in shock. The klaxons, the alarms, the inhuman screams coming from her own throat. It all mixed together. She looked down at the bodies, her throat constricted around a cry. The faces. The faces were not them. They were other people. The two fighter pilot recruits, Ashdown and Shing. The klaxons. She jolted up in her bed, shaking her head and trying to figure out what was real and what was a dream. The images were old, just memories. Nightmares, not dreams, but the sound. The alarm was new. She rubbed her eyes and tried to clear her head. Commander, are you there? She recognized the voice, Lieutenant Grace. The sound of the voice was almost unrecognizable over the klaxon of the red alert. Sweat stained her undershirt and she grabbed a soiled uniform top from the floor to mop her face. Poe here, what's happening on you? An explosion on deck 31, sir. And after the explosion, the hull buckled down there and flooded the entire deck before the emergency bulkhead came down. We've got casualty reports. I'm on my way she said, trying not to groan as she struggled to her feet. So much for sleep. By the time Poe reached the bridge again, the klaxon had stopped, but the bridge crew was in a frenzy. The operations station flurried with activity as the ops crew did their best to manage and coordinate the emergency response to the hull breach, and the security section was already organizing an investigation into the cause of the explosion. Was it intentional, or was it just caused by the water pressure? said Poe as she walked through the door to the bridge. We don't know yet, Commander. Anya stood up from the captain's chair and stepped back as Poe approached the command station and examined the console. She scanned through the data for the number that mattered. Nine. Damn it, nine more. At least the nine crew members stuck behind the emergency bulkhead were presumed dead, unless they'd all had time to reach an ASA suit or somehow found a pocket of oxygen trapped behind a bulkhead. Have internal sensors been able to scan for life signs? said Poe, turning back to the op center. A young technician shook his head. No, sir, the salt water is interfering with sensor readings. Another voice sounded over the calm. Bridge, this is Chief Simmons in engineering. Sir, that uh, blast knocked out our gravitic thrusters. Conventional only until we get that gravitic field projector repaired. As the man spoke, Poe could hear the deck plates groan under her feet as the strain from the pressure warped the girders and support structure of the ship. How much more could the ship take? If there was a saboteur aboard, now was the time to find out, before they could kill another nine people, or ninety, or all of them. How many were left? Six hundred and seventy? Or was it six hundred and sixty-three now? Thank you, Chief. Keep me apprised of progress. Pro out. She leaned in toward Lieutenant Grace, keeping her voice low to avoid the bridge crew overhearing. Do you think one of Tamaga's men could be responsible? I've got Velasky locked down in the brig, so I think we can eliminate him as a possibility. 
What about the men aboard the shuttle? Could they have triggered it remotely somehow? Grace puffed the hair out of her eyes. Possible, but I don't want to remove them from the shuttle. They're all armed, and we can't trust Velasky that they want to help us. For now we've got to keep them in their makeshift brig. We can disable all shuttle functions remotely. That would ensure they're not using the shuttle's functions to screw with the ship, suggested Grace. Good idea. Poe bowed her head, thinking. Anya, she said, turning to Lieutenant Grace. We need intel. We need to know the second the Caligula leaves so we can get out of here. Grace nodded. Sounds reasonable. We need at least to know its position, so if we have to break the surface we can do so when the Caligula's on the other side of the planet. And I think the only way we're going to know that is to shift a fighter out there. Who do you trust? Without skipping a beat, Anya replied. I trust me. Megan shook her head. No. I'm not letting another senior officer off this ship. We can't afford to lose you. Choose someone else. Fine, um, I'll send Lieutenant Quadri, and I'll stick the newbie with him as his gunner, Ashdown. He is the least disappointing of the bunch. Ashdown. Poe's back stiffened. She remembered his charred face from her dream, still fresh in her memory. Very well. Go. Poe waved her hand to the back of the bridge, indicating to Grace to get a move on. As she watched her wing commander leave, she waded in among the chaos of the op center. Time to track down the saboteur. Gavin almost danced he was so excited. Strapping himself in next to Lieutenant Quadri, a dark-haired, lean young man himself, probably no older than twenty-five by Gavin's eye, he engaged his console and began going through his pre-flight checklist he'd learned over the past week. What the hell are you doing? said Quadri. Doing pre-flight? Nubi, this is an urgent mission, not a training run. There is no time. Engage the sensors, but passive only, and keep your thumbs ready to twitch in case we need to shoot our way out of a tight spot. Just leave everything else to me, got it? His dark eyes scanned over him and Gavin nearly wilted under the stare. Yes, sir. Quadri nodded his approval and thumbed open his comm channel. Gridge, request permission to leave P-Town. Commander Poe's voice sounded over the main speaker. Permission granted, P-1. Make your shift just fifty meters or so above our current position, just above the ice, then scan the sky before you head up there. Poe out. Quadri keyed the coordinates into the console and looked over at Gavin. Ready, kid? Gavin grinned. Wipe that smirk off your face, it's bad luck. Quadri looked back down at his console. Engaging in three, two, one. As Gavin watched, the view of the fighter deck disappeared replaced suddenly by the spectacular sight of an endless field of ice sheets, fragmented by deep blue, icy cold water under a pristine purple-blue sky, without a single cloud. Too cold for clouds. He peered down below the craft at the ice sheet that hid the phoenix and gaped in awe. There was a thick, white layer of frost over the top, making the sheet completely opaque. There was no way any orbiting ship would be able to see under it. Ashton. Quadri glanced at him with an expectant look in his eyes. Oh, a right scanning. Gavin flicked on the visual scanners, which made high-resolution filtered images of the sky above them. After a minute, the computer gave him its conclusion. The orbital space above the North Pole was clear. For now, at least. We're clear, he said. Sky acknowledged as clear. Engaging engines now. Hold on to your butt. I'm taking us out fast with conventional thrusters. Too risky for gravitics. Gavin nodded and immediately was thrown hard back into his seat. The bow of the ship pointed up and they began to pick up speed at an alarming rate. He felt his cheeks sag backward toward his ears and found it difficult to breathe. He reckoned they were pushing four Gs. The leading edge of the fighter started to glow red. Gavin checked the altimeter and saw that they'd already passed three clicks. Quadri pulled back on the accelerator, reducing their acceleration to near zero, and the fierce glow on the leading edges of the bow and wings faded to a dull red, and then to nothing. Gavin saw the planet fall away beneath them, and the view of the blue sea speckled with the ice islands morphed into a sight that he still found breathtaking. The curvature of the planet, and the clouds far below, marking a distinct line between the green-blue of the lower atmosphere and the purple-black of the upper atmosphere and space. Fifty clicks, said Gavin. We're good to accelerate again. The atmosphere is pretty thin. Quadri hit the accelerator, throwing Gavin once again back into his seat. 
He fingered his console, initiating a passive EM and infrared scan in all directions from the ship. He had no idea what orbit the Caligula might be in, so he might as well scan all of them. An indicator flashed at him. Contact! Coming up fast behind us! Quadri glanced at his console in alarm. What is it? Hurry, tell me what it is! Gavin fumbled with his controls, trying to remember his scant training. Um, okay. Trying to read the transponder. Where was it? Which button? He breathed relief as he saw the appropriate control and read off the resulting code out loud. Merchant freighter out of the Oberon system. Registry code HY11-14- Okay, okay, I don't need a speech. Just to tell me if the contact is Imperial or not. You don't think the Imperials might have enlisted the help of all the merchant freighters in orbit to look for us? I hear the Empire can be persuasive, said Gavin, trying to keep the edge of sarcasm out of his voice. Mm, yeah, you're right. I'll incline our orbit away from them. As Quadri pulled at the controls, the ship rotated and accelerated to the east. Gavin felt vindicated and grinned as he scanned his console for more results. So, uh, what's the plan here? We scanned for the Caligula, but then what? Won't they be able to see us as we see them? Yeah, but we're faster than they are. If they try to give us trouble, we'll just shift to the opposite side of the planet and make them catch up. We just need to keep an eye on them and shift back to the Phoenix when we see them doing anything suspicious. You know, like fire missiles done at her or something. Got it. Gavin got the feeling he was in for a long ride. Or not. Contact! This one just appeared out of nowhere. No. Wait, three contacts. Get a read on them, newbie. Gavin's heart froze. Um, Quadri, they've got an Imperial code. They're fighters, but... He shook his head, trying to figure out his readings. Quadri's voice had reached a crescendo. But what? But... He began gulping. These fighters have a code that matches the fighters on the rock. Wasn't she destroyed back at Earth? Quadri shrugged. It looks like one survived, and the Empire stripped out her fighters. Gavin. He turned to Ashdown. This is bad news. Those fighters have the exact same capabilities as us. A regular Imperial fighter? Sure, that's no problem. But three of our own? That's a problem. What do we do? Do we shift back to P-Town? Quadri smirked. To hell with that. We're taking the bastards out. Gavin's frozen heart gave way to a deep knot in his stomach. He saw Quadri fire up the gravitic drive, and they accelerated up to match the speed of the incoming fighters. With a gulp, Gavin readied his triggers and prepared to get missile locks. Quadri let out a war whoop as he flipped the ship ninety degrees and blasted out of the pursuit plane. In a split second, he tapped on the gravitics to shift them Z-500 meters, and suddenly Gavin saw the underbelly of one of the fighters loom up fast in the viewport. His twitchy thumbs squeezed the trigger and the fighter exploded in a fiery cloud. Nice shooting, kid. Hey, you're not as bad as Grace says. Gavin laughed. Yeah, that was pretty... Don't get cocky, there's still two more. We're only lucky that these pilots probably haven't developed any tactics based on the short-range gravitic shift. A blinding flash ahead of them suggested otherwise, and Quadri hit the shift controls to get them out of the way of the suddenly incoming fighter. Shit! Their fighter flipped 180, giving Gavin a momentary view of the craft that had strafed them, but he missed his shots. It's okay, kid. We'll just wear them down. Try to keep up. The starfield flipped again, making Gavin's stomach lurch. He had to keep telling himself it was all a video game. It wasn't real, he told himself, just a game. Red streaks strafed past the viewport by Gavin's left shoulder. He caught his breath in his throat. Just a game. Just a game. Titus glanced up at the Admiral. Sir, our fighters report they've engaged a craft from the Phoenix. Excellent, Captain. Keep me appraised of their progress. Sensors, he called behind him. The Phoenix is here somewhere. Find them. The sensor officer nodded and busied himself with the console. Titus wasn't sure what else the man could be doing, other than what he was already doing. The sensors only had so much bandwidth and could only scan a certain portion of the space above the planet at a given time. Use whatever resources you need, sensors. If you think an extra five technicians will help you get the job done, then just say the word, Trajan said. A look of surprise crossed the sensor officer's face. A whole team of technicians helping him with his job? I'm not sure I'd know what to do with them, sir. Trajan's eyes darted toward the man, who looked away in what Titus could see was revulsion. 
The censor officer apparently had not grown used to the crater of Trajan's left eye. Titus wanted to reach out to the man and warn him to keep his emotions in check around the admiral. He'd never seen him lash out at anyone because of the eye, but he didn't want any preventable outbursts either. I'm sure you'll think of something, censor officer, said Trajan coolly and turned back to face Titus. Captain... Send word to Astrometrix to devote every telescope, every camera, every device that can detect a photon, neutron, proton, neutrino, or muon to scanning the star field for the Phoenix. That fighter came from somewhere, and if I don't have it in my possession soon, I swear I'll bomb the planet into oblivion. The Admiral gripped the armrests of the captain's chair until his knuckles were white. Titus was taken aback. He had never heard the Admiral raise his voice, or even sound remotely flustered. He had always been the model of absolute control, but Trajan's tone suggested he was quickly losing his patience. Perhaps, sir, we could press Villar to lend us more direct assistance. Perhaps we could even enlist the help of the merchant ships in orbit. Trajan steepled his hands in front of his face. Yes. He breathed in deeply through his nose and released the held breath through his mouth with a sigh. An excellent idea, Captain. Good work. I will contact Villar from the ready room. You will handle the communications with the merchant ships from here. He stood up to leave. And, Captain, he said before turning, did you manage to send condolences to the family of the chief engineer yet? Titus's back stiffened. What an odd question, and the meaning was unmistakable. It was a warning. Titus had crossed a line somehow. He should have kept his mouth shut when Trajan was expressing his impatience. And now the implied threat was obvious. Uh, yes, sir, I did, said Titus. He racked his brain for something else to say to placate the man. The lunatic. B but I neglected to send any bonus pay. Shall I do so? Trajan paused with his back, turned toward the captain. No. Funds are tight right now. We can't spare anything from destroying the resistance. He started walking toward the door. Carry on, Captain. Carry on. Titus rubbed the back of his neck and breathed deep. They had to find that ship. For the good of his own crew. They might not survive Trajan losing his patience in the future. Gavin whooped as the second fighter from the Caligula burst into a fiery explosion, which was quickly snuffed out by the rarefied atmosphere of the upper exosphere of destiny. Cut the noise, we ain't done yet, newbie, said Lieutenant Quadri, who hit the gravitic shift initiator, shifting them in the blink of an eye to tail behind one of the two remaining fighters. Before Gavin had a chance to even aim, the ship shifted away. They're learning, he said as he squeezed off a few rounds at the fourth fighter, which flitted momentarily into view. Yep, said Quadri. I guess we'll just have to step it up a notch. Without even a lurch, the ship stopped its forward motion and plummeted down towards the atmosphere. What's our capacitor charge? Gavin glanced at his console. Only fifty gigajoules. Quadri swore. Only one or two more shifts until we need to recharge. Let's make them count. We'll wait until one of the shifts to take us out, and then we'll move. Be ready. Got it. Gavin gripped the controls and held his thumbs nervously over the triggers. Really, it was just like a video game. The gravitic drive accelerated all parts of their bodies at once, removing any sensation of G-forces. It seemed to detach him from the physical reality of their swerves and plunges, serving to make it seem like he was still sitting in Jet's bunk, whipping his friend at yet another round of Starfighter. Out of the corner of his eye he saw a flash of movement. One of the fighters had just shifted into place, just a few dozen meters away, plunging down through the atmosphere to match their speed. With a flick of a finger, Quadri shifted them over to trail the other fighter, which Gavin sprayed with a barrage of fire. It exploded with a puff of debris. Gavin peered down out his viewport to watch the body of the pilot fall into the atmosphere. He couldn't tell if the man had ejected or if the blast had killed him and knocked him out of the wreckage of the bird now spiraling down through the atmosphere with its owner. Quadri breathed deeply. Okay, now you can celebrate. What about the other one? He shifted away when he saw his buddy skydiving. 
Gavin whooped again. So you're telling me that we just took out four fighters? All by ourselves? Is that what you're telling me? He asked, his voice rising in excitement. <laughs> Looks like it, newbie. Quadri pulled up on the controls and pointed them back up to the line of atmosphere, wrapping the planet, and gunned the accelerator. Don't get all cocky on me. No, sir. Of course not, sir, he said with a mock salute. Quadri continued. I mean, it was pretty badash and all, I've got to admit. So, when we get back, the story for the rest of the P-Town jocks will be that we took out eight. Gavin chuckled. Right. Got it. He looked back at his console. Caps are back up at 100 gigajoules. When do you think we should go back? When we find the Caligula. I'll adjust our trajectory to take us on a highly inclined orbit. We should be able to scan most of the space above the planet that way. We'll find her soon. And then? Quadri blew air out of his mouth. But hell if I know. Then it's time for Commander Poe to come up with another crazy-ash plan. Gavin shrugged. Hiding under an ice seat doesn't seem that crazy to me, he said. <laughs> that just shows you've never served in the Imperial fleet. They don't do shit like that there. That's the point of the Empire. Order, rules, control. That's why they could never just let Earth govern itself. We like to show our crazy too much for their liking. And Captain Mercer and Commander Poe have just a bit too much crazy for the Empire's liking. Why the hell do you think they're spending so much time chasing us? We're just one ship, after all. The Resistance basically got crushed back there at the shipyard's battle. And yet here they are chasing us down. Gavin turned to Quadri. Teeth. Do you think they're just chasing us because of those two? Of course. Mercer is turning into another Pritchard. And they can't afford another Pritchard. But isn't he dead? Quadri smirked. Dead? You must never have met Pritchard. That man is a certified genius. No sniveling Imperial Admiral could outwit him. No, newbie. He's out there somewhere, biding his time until the right moment. He'll come back with some fleet he's pulled out of his ash and save Earth. You just watch. Gavin shrugged again. Yeah, here's hoping. Captain Titus turned to the communication station. Ensign Evans, send out a wide band broadcast to every ship in orbit. After a moment, the comm officer said, You're alive, Captain. Titus cleared his throat. To all merchant vessels in orbit around destiny, this is Captain Titus of the NPQR Caligula. I would understand if you felt unnerved by our presence here, as this is not Imperial space. To be honest, I have no interest in staying longer than we must, but I am looking for a hijacked Imperial vessel. The NPQR Phoenix is in the vicinity of Destiny, and we will be eternally grateful to the merchant or syndicate who manages to find it and tell me her location. There may even be a reward involved. He glanced back at his XO, who grinned. He continued, but rest assured that whoever does not help in the search will be added to our list of merchant vessels engaged in illicit activity, and will be targeted or detained by any Imperial fleet ship in the future. We have scanned the orbit of Destiny, and already have a log of every ship here, so don't think you can slip out unnoticed. I await all of your responses, relay them by text to my communications officer. Titus out. Sir, the tactical officer yelled out. Titus spun to face him. One of our fighters has just returned, sir. Just one? The officer nodded. They're messaging us that the others were destroyed and they barely managed to escape intact. Titus shook his head. The pilot was lucky Trajan was not on the bridge. Order him to return to the fighter bay for a debriefing. I want the report in twenty minutes. Yes, sir. So, the Phoenix's fighter fought off four of their own, destroying three. Three next-generation gravitic drives lost out of twenty-three transferred from the rock. He made a mental note to instruct the wing commander to develop new tactics involving the new drives, since the Phoenix fighter most likely had been practicing with it for weeks now. Sir! Titus spun again toward Ensign Evans. What now? Sir, I've got a merchant vessel, but more like a pirate ship that claims to know where the Phoenix is. Where? They haven't told me yet, sir. They want to talk to you. Titus nodded. Patch me through. A ragged voice sounded over the speaker. Titus? Captain Titus, he corrected. To whom am I speaking? This is Captain Vorat of the cruiser Ragswan. I can take you to your ship. 
Titus nodded. Good. How shall we for a price? Vorat interrupted, his voice degenerating into a spasm of violent coughing. It sounded as though he had a vicious cold. Titus nodded to himself. If you give me information that leads to the Phoenix, you will be rewarded. But until then, you receive nothing until I see evidence of your knowledge. What are the coordinates? Vorat laughed. No, I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. I don't fear you. Put me on whatever damn list you want, and I never go into Imperial space anyway. No, I want pressed bars of gold. I know you Imperial boys all carry a supply on your ships. You know, for <clears throat> just such an occasion as this. He was right, of course. But the presence of emergency funds on Imperial capital ships was supposed to be classified information, especially that they had pressed gold bars. Fine. I'll give you two kilograms of gold. Borat laughed even harder, then coughed even more violently. Titus cringed at the awful, phlegm-filled noise. Two! That is what, just one pressed bar? No, Captain, I was thinking more along the lines of twenty pressed bars. I haven't got twenty. Borat sniffed. Then I'll take what you've got. After a moment's pause, Titus shrugged. Surely the phoenix, at a build cost of over a quadrillion credits, was worth more than the five million that ten pressed gold bars would set them back. Ten. That's all a capital ship carries. It was a blatant lie. Capital ships like the Caligula carried one hundred at least. But that seemed to satisfy Vorat. Ten it is. <clears throat> we'll be at your ship shortly to collect payment. No, nope. information first, said Titus, sitting down in his captain's chair. <laughs> You expect me to spill my peas first and then let you shove a torpedo up my ass as you go collect your precious ship? Captain Titus shrugged. Fine, I'll send half to your ship by shuttle, and then you will escort us to the Phoenix, at which point I'll transfer the other half. How's that? Clearly this was more what Vorat had in mind as he responded immediately. It is well. I'll be there in ten minutes. Titus drew a hand over his throat to signal Evans to cut the calm. Pirates. Thank Athena for the Pax Humana, or their filth would still have free reign over all the thousand worlds. Chapter 7 Ben groaned. He tried to reach up to his head to rub his piercing headache away, but found himself unable to do so. Strange, his shoulders hurt too. No, they screamed at him. Hot, fiery pain flared in his arms and shoulders, waking him up enough that he finally opened his eyes and looked up. He was hanging, dangling about a foot off the stone floor by his wrists, which were bound by chains, attached to the ceiling. He let out a sharp puff of air as he tried to move, and the pain in his shoulder erupted into daggers pressing deep into every nerve. Trying not to move again, he looked down. He was naked, except for the collar around his neck that he'd seen many of Villar's people wear. Villar. Where was she? He strained his neck around to glance at the space surrounding him. It was a simple, brick-walled room, with nothing other than a few sets of chains hanging down from rivets in the ceiling. There was one small light fixture and one door in front of him. He strained his head to look behind, but the pain was too intense. And he was alone. Gritting his teeth, he tensed his shoulder muscles and, in spite of the searing pain, yanked as hard as he could against the restraints holding him in. They felt hopelessly solid. He lifted himself up a few inches and let his weight down precipitously again in another quick tug. Again, not so much as a creak from the rivets, sunk deep into the dusty wooden beams. He groaned in pain. Mr. Jemez, a monitor informed me that you were awake, said a voice behind him. Villar. He heard her footsteps approach, and she appeared to his left holding a small electronic screen. She flashed it at him with a vague grin. The callers keep me appraised of all my slaves' progress. You've received quite a nasty knock there. I do hope that you're not in too much pain. My customer wants you in tip-top shape for when he gets back from his trip. Shouldn't be long now. Her customer? He had thought he was destined to spend the rest of his life toiling away in her uranium mines. Where are my people? He managed to croak out. 
suddenly realizing that his mouth was bone dry. They're safe, if that's what you're worried about. Well, except for one of your hired muscle. He tried to remove his collar rather abruptly, and it didn't end well for him. Which reminds me, please don't try to remove your collar, she said, a sly grin stretching into a cunning smile. She added with a wink, won't end well for you either. Leave the fiber optic implant alone, and you'll be just fine. It can handle snags and incidental contact, but if you attempt to rip it out, the bomb inside your head will utterly destroy your brain. And slaves without brains are not much use. You see, Dr. Stone prefers his slaves to give themselves to him completely, of their own free will. She started pacing around him, stretching up a hand to his bare chest and stroking it gently. He recoiled at her touch as if it were a viper. Dr. Stone. He's brilliant, by the way. The finest nano-cyberneticist in the galaxy. He's paying top coin for this body. He expects you to resist at first. In fact, that's how he gets his cheap thrills. But his ultimate pleasure is that you give yourself to him completely and utterly, trailing after him like a dog, not even thinking about your own wants or desires, but focused singularly on him and his needs. It'll never happen, he said. He tested his feet, trying to raise them, but realized they were also chained down to the floor. He sighed. No way to lash out with his legs and knock her out. She noticed his slight movement. You may try to resist all you want. In fact, the more noise and thrashing you make when he arrives to inspect you, the higher the price you'll fetch. Just this immaculate body alone will be enough to land you the highest price I've ever commanded for a slave. She stroked his abdomen, looking at him hungrily. I have half a mind to keep you for myself. Pity that he likes to mar things so. Her voice drifted off in almost a sing-song tone. I hear he likes knives and other more creative tools. A beep from the data pad drew her attention. Villar, Dr. Stone has arrived. She held her pad up to her face. Good. Tell him I'll be there shortly. Ben willed moisture into his mouth and tried to speak again. You won't get away with this. Poe will find you. The Phoenix still has guns. She'll blast the compound to hell before she lets you keep us. She raised a lazy eyebrow. The Phoenix? No, I'm afraid my most trusted slave of all is currently on board your ship preparing to take it over. No, Jemez. Soon Poe will be joining you. We've got quite a shortage of good, strong-bodied women in our pleasure house. I'm afraid our customers have been going through them at an alarming rate cost me a fortune to keep the place stocked with local girls. Sometimes I even have to buy girls from Old Earth through my imperial contacts. She walked behind him. He heard her footsteps pass through the door, which closed almost too softly to hear. When she'd gone, he immediately started thrashing against the restraints, tensing his abdomen and pulling up on his feet as hard as he could, to no avail. There was no escaping the chains. Not yet, not until they dared to release him and he'd have to be ready. Dr. Stone did not sound like pleasant company. A day had passed since the explosion, and Poe had worked for hours, going back and forth with the science, ops, and security team about every possible scenario that might have caused the rupture, but the source still evaded them. And with the emergency bulkheads holding back over ten atmospheres of pressurized seawater, there was no chance of investigating the central location of the hull rupture, not in person, anyway, and likely not with the automated hull repair droids. They were not designed for operation underwater and had not budged from their housing. To the acting head of security, she said, Well, at least evacuate everyone away from the outer hull. Get them all within the first sets of emergency bulkheads. If this happens again, at least we can avoid casualties. Ensign Zabo and Science piped in. If this happens again, we're risking a progressive collapse of every deck, not just at the source. That explosion and the subsequent water penetration weakened the structural integrity of the ship. It's like an egg with a piece of the shell missing. We're nowhere near as strong as we were a few hours ago, and even then the risk of hull breach was high. Commander, I'm not even convinced that this explosion wasn't just caused by the extreme pressure acting on some power conduit or hydraulic system somewhere. 
Commander Poe approached the science station from the captain's chair. Then how long do you think we have, Ensign? Ensign Zabo shrugged. No idea. Uh, but every hour we stay under here, the more likely our hull gets corroded, the more likely our conventional thruster ports get rusted out. More stress on the hull means more microcracks in the support girders running the length of the ship. It's a crapshoot, Commander. Every hour we're here is a gamble. And yet every hour down here is another hour that we're alive. She knew the words were correct, but she realized that hiding was not a long-term solution. The Caligula would either find the Phoenix and drop a few megaton nuclear bombs on them, which, given their immersion in water, would likely crush them, or they would just camp out until the Phoenix surfaced and destroy her in orbit. Something had to give. Ayala, you have the bridge. She turned toward the tattooed, wispy, white-haired Belenite at tactical, and thumbed her toward the captain's chair. Ay, sir, said Lieutenant Ayala, who stood, and tentatively sunk into the chair in the center of the bridge. Poe almost thought she looked apprehensive. Guilty? For what? She shook her head once out in the hallway. Clearly the lack of sleep was getting to her, making her suspect even the most loyal officers of nameless crimes. As the elevator doors closed, she tapped on her data pad and turned on the comm. Sergeant Jace and Sergeant Tamaga, report to the brig immediately. Something had to give. And if that meant she had to finally place trust in two people that could undo everything they'd worked for over the last week, then so be it. But it wasn't just the last week. The shipyard's operation had been planned for years, ever since Pritchard disappeared. The D-Day commemoration was to have been the breakout moment for the Resistance, the moment when all their years of suffering and fighting would come to a head and pay off. And now look at them hiding in a half-broken ship under the ocean of some godforsaken world, while their captain, security chief, and chief engineer were held hostage by some petty slaving syndicate. How did it come to this? Open his door, she said to the security officer standing guard at the console in the brig. Yes, sir. Velasquez's door slid open and she walked in, seeing him rise from his bunk. Commander Po. His Russian accent hung thick on his words as if not speaking for half the day made him unaccustomed to talking like the rest of them. Poe stopped in front of him and put her hands on her hips. Captain Vlasky, how bad do you want to see your daughter again? The man shrugged. Bidly. But if you do not trust me to lead you to your men down on the surface, then I suppose we are still at stalemate. Poe sighed. Recent events have changed our situation. We can't stay under the water forever, and we need to find our people and get the hell off destiny, and we need your help to do it. Velasky smiled. I agree. His smile unnerved her. In spite of his claims that he'd changed, that he only wanted to be free again, something about him nagged at her. He was not completely forthcoming, that much was clear, but she did not get the sense that he was blatantly lying to her. He really did want to be free. No one could hide that desire. To want to be free was to be human. What I don't get is how you actually pull this off. The Caligula is in orbit. If you help us, they're bound to find out. They have no qualms about blasting an entire planet to its core just to enforce their will, and to punish traitors. If you do this, you are a traitor to the Empire. I've never been a friend to the Empire, Commander Poe. So it's no skin off my back, as they say. Trust me, I can disappear. They need never find me. He glanced at the door as two more men appeared. Eh, what's the trouble? Said Staff Sergeant Jace as he swaggered into the cell, a bulge in his cheek from some chew. Tamaga followed close behind. The trouble is on the planet. How do you gentlemen feel about leading a rescue mission on destiny? Jace shrugged. Bring it. Poe raised an eyebrow and then turned to Tamaga. Sergeant, we really could use your urban warfare expertise. Tamaga kept his expression vague, and yet she could see him calculating, thinking. Was it worth it to him and his men to help? She hoped he saw the obvious, that if he didn't help, he most likely would die with the rest of them. I will help as a show of goodwill, he said, in the interest of our new friendship. Good. 
Blasky, how many soldiers has Velar got in her employ down there? The pirate shrugged. At the compound? Fifty, at least. But between my men, yours, and the element of surprise, we should do well. The only problem will be these callers. He tapped the electronic device around his neck. She can kill me and all my men in an instant with press of the button. And by this point, you're captain, too. Your boys will have to pin her down quickly before she has chance to do anything. Really, without some kind of plan, it's huge risk. He was right. Poe realized that they still had a ways to go on planning this rescue. And do you have any ideas? Velasky smiled again, this time more jovially than before. He was apparently quite pleased with himself. I do. I know frequency domain her remote controller operates on. If we jam that frequency space with whole lot of white noise, then our callers will be unable to see any signal she send out. At least until she figures out what we're up to and changes the signal frequency. You don't think she'll have foreseen something like that? If it's as simple as broadcasting white noise, Velasky held up a hand, first of all, it will take powerful signal. Only your ship could generate something that large, none of mine can. Second, Commander, you don't realize what it's like to be slave after so many years. At first, men will constantly be looking for ways to escape. But after a while, after seeing so many of your comrades die in the attempt, you become resigned. After that, complacent. All of her top lieutenants, including me, have become quite complacent over the years. She treats her top people rather well. Not like the uranium miners. You'd think we were family. Trust me, she won't be expecting this. Poe shuddered at the thought of thinking of your captor as family. Stockholm Syndrome? She wondered if some of Valar's top people suffered from it. Tamaga cleared his throat. Captain Velasky, what is the situation on the ground? Will the Phoenix's men be held in buildings, or on the surface, or do you expect them to be in the mines? The mines. Willar will want your men as far from the surface as she can manage. That's where we send all new recruits, as we call them. It makes escape during the first few years far less likely. Later, as slaves prove their loyalty, they can graduate to the upper levels of the mine. Maybe even see a little sunshine, you know. The best get transferred to surface to 